knowing having this connection with plants is just like having friends wherever you go traveling to a new place is like meeting new friends that you recognize is you know immediate connection between with old friends hello and welcome to the herbs with rosalie podcast a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine as food and through nature connection i'm your host rosalie de la forêt I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. I can't even remember the first time that I saw Tom's book, Botany in a Day, but I know that I've spent countless hours poring over it. I've known Tom through various ways over the years and was really excited to have this chance to sit down with him. He is a plant person through and through, and his curiosity about plants, regenerative agriculture, and simple living is infectious. For those of you who don't already know him, Thomas J. Elpel is the director of Green University in Southwest Montana and the author of nine books ranging in topics from wilderness survival to consciousness. He is best known for his book, Botany in a Day, The Patterns Method of Plant Identification. With his background in wilderness survival skills, Tom applied a self-sufficiency ethic to all aspects of his life, from living in a tent and building his own stone and log home, to later launching his own publishing company. Tom has produced two card games that teach plant family patterns and one that teaches wildlife ecology. He's presently writing a book about the ecology of the American West. Tom, I'm so excited to have you on the show. Thank you so much for being here. Well, and thank you for having me. It's uh, great to uh, see you again, and it's been a while. (laughs) It's been a while. Yeah, we were just discussing that maybe it's been 15 years, which was kind of a (laughs) surprise to me, actually. Um, I do get your newsletters, and so I feel like you're always there in the ethers. You know, I get updates and stuff. But yeah, it's been a long time since we were hanging out in person. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to dive in to like all that is Tom Elpel. I feel like you have such an eclectic background and just interesting ways that your passions have like come into fruition um, through your books and your projects. And so, yeah, I'm excited to talk about it all. Um, unlike most of my guests, you aren't strictly an herbalist and maybe don't even identify as an herbalist, but you are very much a plant person. Um You've written like the quintessential book on botany from a plant family perspective. You have foraging books, um, even games around plants. So um, let's, I would like to hear like, yeah, how did you follow all these different threads and how did this like, you know, come together in, um, into your offerings and how did the plant world even, you know, jump out at you as like, this is an avenue you're going to explore in your life. (laughs) <laughs> sure so yeah really it was my grandmother that got me started with mm. the plants more than anything i mean my father had introduced me to a first plant uh, it was a mustard that he called miner's lettuce and uh but it was my grandmother that was really immersed uh in the plant world she had taken some plant classes uh in the 70s and then was so was getting into the edible and medicinal plants and uh, so in my formative years late 70s early 80s just going out and collecting different herbs for tea on that. Uh, so she taught me some initial plants and then I started wanting to know, well, what are all the other ones? Hmm. So yeah, I just started with uh, identifying uh, plants, just flipping through uh, the books, uh, color photo books, trying to identify plants. And then uh, later going to high school in Bozeman, Montana, uh, I would anything I couldn't identify myself, I would take into the herbarium here. and um, the helpful folks there would help me key it out, go through the botanical key, give me a botanical name that I could then go home and, and research. This being pre-internet, I'd go through my books and look it up, read anything that I could about it. Yeah, and then I had this idea, um, and it's like looking at the technical manuals, the, the, the dichotomous keys, it was like, 
this is just too complicated. And it's like, I'm going to write a book called Botany in a Day. And I didn't really have a clue how I was going to do that. But uh, I was just on this, this quest since I was in high school. So I was, I'm going to write this book that makes plant identification easy. And, uh, and wow, so I you could, had that idea in high school. To, like, I, that was I, when the idea was born. I believe so, yeah. I had the, wow. the title uh, early on uh, hmm. before I had the means of <laughs> the method uh, to it. And I think, um, I think sometimes when there's something that's just a very big part of our lives that we tend to get some sort of echoes from the, the future, sort of a future memory. And so uh, for me, botany in the day has just been such a huge part of my life that mm -hmm. uh, kind of had the, the title before the, the, really the idea. <laughs> <laughs> behind it there so <laughs> i love that so much because i like in, as far as botany goes i'm a botany in a day person like your book was very transformative for me and that's still how i like organize botany in my brain mm -hmm. i am not the, the person families. who's gonna like yeah be a plant families i'm not the one who's going to like get the like hitchcock like you know huge textbook and like key things out i have never felt that desire and i have made it you know 25 years in herbalism without having to do that i admire the people who can like mm, yes. you know it's like it's a great totally. skill and it's like 100 like awesome that people do that so not disparaging it but botany a day is definitely more my groove so i like that you're like yeah this is too complicated let's do it because i'm just like oh that's like that's what i needed thank you yeah and really the um the more that I've done plants, the, the I think the less I know and the less I want to know. <laughs> and um, uh, I actually do a lot of what these, these days when I when I start classes, I like to introduce a little uh, deer botany as far as going out and grazing on things within some basic guardrails of safety there, but uh, tasting, exploring the land, and it's like we we tend to get real wordy with plants, and you know, it's like you, you can go up to a, a, a plant and give it a name and then pretty much ignore the plant and just go off in world war you know word world talking and talking and talking and completely ignore the plant and it's like i i, I just kind of realized that uh like the deer know uh, every plant in their environment they know uh, what every plant tastes like what it smells like uh whether it's uh going to help them put on fat quickly or uh, you know, if, if it's edible, if it's uh, more medicinal. And so and the deer aren't taking any, you know, they're not going to school. They're not taking plant classes, uh, not cracking open the botany uh, books or, or anything like that. And so they just have this, uh, this very experiential grasp of mm -hmm. the world around them. And so, uh, you know, we talk about gaining a, a deep nature connection. Mm -hmm. Yet, um, you know, I don't really know anybody that has like a deep nature connection the way that a deer does in terms of, knowing all the plants in their environment and so i think that we can really learn from that and uh you know we don't and, you know i used, used to use a lot more like botanical names uh, and they sound important and all that but uh i just less interested in that all the time and it's like it's turned me loose i want to go graze like a deer and have that firsthand experience of the natural world i now have new herbal goals tom like i want to be a deer <laughs> herbalist that's, okay. <laughs> no, I love that, the experiential, because that's so much, you know, what I, what a lot of my teachings are too, is like, how can we know a plant if we know the name and we don't know how it tastes or how it feels and how it moves through the seasons and how our bodies interact with it and even the ecological perspectives. And um, there's so much to know about a plant beyond the name. Um, that, that's for sure. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I just led a, a two-week uh, botany and foraging intensive out in uh, mm. northern and western Idaho. And, yeah, that was the first thing we do is just uh, go out on a little deer botany walk and start grazing on all the, you know, the, the trees and the bushes. <laughs> just, uh, uh, you know, and most of it tastes pretty yucky, but uh, <laughs> but it's like some of these it might be things that we've we've been around all of our lives. And it's like, mm -hmm. yet never actually tasted this. Uh, this tree and, and don't have that connection. So mm -hmm. uh, it's just such a, a really a powerful experience. Uh, and then we can kind of go from that uh, looking more, you know, like family traits. And, uh, and, and and honestly, once you have the family patterns, that can guide so much. That, you know, there's, there's some families, of course, like the Parsi family, you recognize that, uh, like the compound umbels, like, uh, uh, you know, big umbrella with little umbrellas. And that just tells you, hey, these are plants we don't mess with without knowing what they are 
Whereas other things like your mint family, your mustard family, it's like, I don't know what it is. I don't care what it is. I'm just going to eat it. <laughs> you know, it's like, a, it's a mint, it's a mustard, whatever. Um, that That's all the information you need to be able to experiment with it, to try it out as, as a spice in your salad or make a tea or something. And um, and it's, it's just such an exciting way to travel the world, you know, discovering and using plants you've never seen before. And knowing something about them, even though you don't know their actual name. Mm -hmm. So when, like, you had the title for Botany in a Day as a high schooler, and now you're talking about, like, the um, the foundation and the baseline of Botany in a Day, like, I would like to feel fill that gap. Like, at what point we were like, oh, here's how you learn Botany in a Day. You learn plant families. Yes. So um, I had... Uh, started fairly early, well, just tried to do everything early in life, I guess. And, uh, uh, you know, I got married at the age of 21 and uh, bought this land where I'm, I'm at now, uh, moved into a tent, uh, started building this house, uh, and then also shortly after started uh, my original school, which was then called Hollow Tap Outdoor Primitive School, uh, and had uh, hosted a um, uh, uh, an herbal class with local herbalist, uh, Rob, Robin Klein from Bozeman. And she used this, uh, this patterns approach and was just talking about, well, you know, here's such and such in the rose family. Notice that the flowers have five petals. There's lots of stamens. The vegetation is astringent. It has that kind of drying quality. When you, you know, when you taste it, it dries up the saliva in your mouth and, you know, it can be used uh, in these ways medicinally. And, so there's this kind of a, a pattern of repetition amongst uh, these related plants. And it's like I had seen family names in my books before, but never really um, an explanation of why one plant would be in one family or another or how that information would be useful. Hmm. And so that was really what um, turned the lights on for me. And so I really, I wrote Botany in a Day as kind of like a research paper to answer my own questions. What are these family patterns for identification? What are the, the common patterns of uses in each of the families? Um, and, you know, and it covers uh, most of the families in the northern latitudes. Uh, as you go south, it, there's still these families are there, but there's additional families that are not covered as thoroughly uh, in the book. Um, but, you know, still, it's been used uh, everywhere from, um, you know, Mesoamerica to uh, Africa, Asia. Um, mm -hmm. People send me reports from all over the world of using uh, a botany in a day. And, uh, and you know, I find if I, if I stay in the latitudes, like going to Northern Europe, for example, it's like the plants might be different, but they're so similar to what we have here that um, it's just like, oh, you know, super... Uh, easy to recognize, uh, whereas I think probably the most distant place that I've been uh, from sort of the core area here for Botany Day is, is going to uh, New Zealand, and that broke off from Australia like 83 million years ago, so it's like really isolated in time, uh, yet of course there's been a huge number of Mediterranean plants that have been introduced uh, that are all uh, in the book. And then uh, even uh, a surprisingly large number of the native plants uh, still uh, from the families that are covered in botany in a day. So it really does have this uh, really global approach to it. It's interesting to hear you talk about this book being used all over the world because I think of it as an herbalist's book. Like I think of it very much of like botany for herbalists, but now I'm like mm -hmm. kind of getting a sense like it's probably, you know, much bigger than that. <laughs> but that's my <laughs> view of it. I had a very strong interest in uh, herbalism in the early days of working on uh, botany in a day. And uh, so, you know, it's just like, what are the patterns, the medicinal patterns of uses, the, the properties that come up uh, in, you know, throughout a family. And then uh, I guess I've kind of trended away from that over time, just, uh, a little, you know, more, inter more interested in the edible uh, side of it and actually just even the expanding on the identification because it's so fun to me um you know wherever i i travel it i mean it's ha, no knowing having this connection with plants is just like having friends wherever you go mm -hmm. and so um going traveling to a new place is like meeting new friends that you recognize is you know immediate connection between with old friends 
And um, so I, I would say my experience with nature is mostly as a nibbler, uh, more than an herbalist. <laughs> I'm a nibbler. I go through like like the deer. It's like, oh, I'll, you know, a nibble on this, a nibble on that. So. <laughs> I would love to see you introduced as a nibbler. Maybe I'll add that to the intro. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so you have foraging in your background. I know that's something you teach. You also have, I mean, we, I want to say we met through John Gallagher, maybe, or just, you know, something in that herbal realm. But then um, we hung out meeting through Lynx Vilden and doing her Stone Age project, which I did not do just to, to not misrepresent, but <laughs> my handsome French husband did it the year you did it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, maybe I'll just talk about that like later um, after, because that's neither here nor there, but all being said that like you have this like self-sufficiency and living off the land mentality and that um, mm -hmm. you have books on that. You have books on participating in nature. You have financial books. Um, you really are like this, you know, I feel like you're someone like inspiration hits you and then you're like have this thirst for knowledge that you then pursue to a great effect. And then your next thing is like, you're going to share that with us. Would you say that's mm. accurate? Uh, well, certainly. Uh, yeah. Get excited about something. And, and it's like, I'm always writing because that's how I learn. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, like, uh, uh, it's like there's a certain base level of of knowledge uh, that I start with. So you know, if it's like, oh, uh, you know, if I know enough about foraging to write a foraging book. And then, of course, anytime you start to write anything down, it highlights the things that you don't know. And then there's uh, uh, that leads to new research. And um, and, we, and we really put together um, a fantastic book with with foraging the Mountain West. It was uh, an area of the country here, um, sort of the everything from the Rockies to the Sierra Nevada Cascades, and in in between there that wasn't covered well in the the foraging literature. Mm -hmm. And in the process of writing that book, I also just kind of opened up a more awareness of. The gaps in that knowledge hmm. and so that actually led to doing these uh, botany and foraging intensives that i do through our school green university and so uh yeah we just wrapped up our, our eighth intensive uh so we weren't uh, we started out near saint mary's idaho uh, harvesting wild rice and uh this is the far the latest in the year that we've done one of these classes from a flower identification standpoint uh that it was more challenging because we didn't have nearly near as many flowers to work with but it was fun um kind of hitting some of the uh fall crops uh, a lot of which are introduced it's it's like it's such a crazy place out there where um like fruit tree fruit and nut trees go wild and become weeds they they just pop up it's like uh wherever you go it's like oh here's you know apple trees plum trees apricot trees walnut trees and uh so we were you know hit the timing well for uh, apples and walnuts and then the native elderberries um and so um yeah we were made like apple cider out apple, apple i brought my uh, cider press out there and we made the uh, apple elderberry uh juice uh with that and uh it brought the canoes out we uh, harvested wild rice and um you know and then dried that uh, parched it stomped it winnowed it um uh enjoyed that in our meals and uh and yeah we're harvesting uh, walnuts and and uh cracking and drying those and cooking with those so uh, so it was really fun to um do all that and actually I, i've been there's a wild cranberry patch and you know oh, so so a lot of these things are not, I mean, the wild rice isn't native, the, uh, the fruit and nut trees aren't native, the, uh, the cranberries aren't native, but I'd been trying to get there for like 10 years and um, actually did this uh, on the way home as when the cranberries were, were ripe. And so uh, one of my students and I uh, paddled out to this uh, cranberry patch and, and picked three gallons of cranberries uh, in like an hour. Oh. And uh, and it was, yeah, it was just so cool. There and there, and it's like the berries almost bigger than the plants. They were huge. Mm -hmm. um, so that that was uh, that was fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I really get the sense from you, Tom, that you're like very experiential, just like the deer, <laughs> like in the way yeah. you learn, the way you teach. Like it's all experience based there, um, which is obviously you know the best way to learn to do it yourself with your own hands. 
Yes, uh, I, I've always been very research oriented, but uh, more and more experiential oriented all the time. Yes. <laughs> I wonder if you'd be willing to mention your canoe trip. Um, I found that so personally, you know, just fascinating and inspiring and it's very different than how most people spend their summers. So um, would you mind just like mentioning that a little bit? And I know you have the book about it, which people can. Uh, hear I do. And, and actually I have it right here because, um, well, because of Russian olives, actually. But mm -hmm. um yeah, so uh, on video, at least, there is the book, uh, Five Months on the Missouri River, Paddling a Dugout Canoe. And so basically, I had um, carved out this canoe with uh, Churchill Clark, who is the great, 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 great grandson of Captain William Clark of the Lewis and Clark Expedition. And then uh, I ended up leading a five-man, five-month uh, expedition down the Missouri River uh, from Three Forks, Montana, where the, the Missouri starts uh, to St. Louis, where the Missouri pours into the Mississippi there. And it was really, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like a race to get to, uh, to get to the end and get it over with. It was really like, to me, I guess I see the Missouri River as being kind of like a, a long, skinny national park. Hmm. And so, uh, you know, every campsite was a new opportunity to, uh, to get out to a hike, to explore, to botanize, to forage. Hmm. And um, so we really were not in a hurry that we kept the miles pretty low on a daily basis. And like every fourth or fifth day, we had um, a day off where we're just parked in one spot to uh, spend a little more time, uh, whether working on projects or, uh, you know, uh, or yeah, foraging and, and all that. So, um, yeah, and that, that was, uh, well, was, for me, any, any adventure is a botanical adventure. Sure, <laughs> and uh, and I've traveled extensively in the West, North, South. Uh, you know, being North in the summer, South in the in the winter, and I've been trying to push more East. So this was uh, uh, for me really a first big push eastward. Uh, and I know St. Louis isn't very far east, but uh, <laughs> uh, for me it was. And um, to do it, I guess when I've when I've toured by car, it's like, there's never enough time to do everything. Uh, you get into a town, you, you do, you know, a couple of things, you rush to the next one. And what was cool about this trip is that when we pulled into a, um, a town on the river, we were there for a few days that, and all on foot and really just felt like we had the chance to, uh, you know, visit all the museums, um, botanize all over town, walk back and forth uh, to the campsite a gazillion times, and just tell we we're kind of like done with a with a place. Hmm. And so um, I really felt like we did the Missouri River that we weren't like just blowing by everything, but hmm. just taking the time to experience everything along, along the way. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's really really wonderful. It's just definitely not not how a lot of people see. The world these days so you know. <laughs> well tom um we decided instead of doing a specific plant like we normally do on the podcast that you would talk about a plant family which seems very apropos for botany in a day <laughs> author um and uh i don't know that i had any like thoughts about what you would do but i wasn't expecting the oleaster family uh so let's begin with why did you choose the oleaster family tom <laughs> well I, I chose the oleaster family because I figured nobody's talking about it. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, I just wanted to, um, I thought it was a little bit more of an obscure family and that would be interesting to shed some light on. And, uh, and, and really it is, I think, um, a compelling family that um, for, for a variety of reasons for, uh, some of us, it's uh, is actually these plants are a big part of our uh, our environment, uh, and where they're not, they have the potential um, to become more important. That um, it's not a particularly big, big family; it was just uh, three genera and about fifty species or so uh, worldwide. So it's it's one of the more uh, smaller families, but um, in addition to having um, edible, you know, edible varying edible fruits to varying degrees some are not very appealing um but yeah some are, are very tasty uh and highly nutritious uh, but these are also like nitrogen fixing plants uh and 
so you know we, we're very focused on the legumes that are uh, the pea family that is very nitrogen fixing, uh, but the um, the oleaster family plants also have that uh, character. So that which is very helpful in terms of like uh, permaculture. That um, so uh, if you want to plant something like say a sea berry or an autumn olive or something amongst your other um, vegetation, that this is something that can be fixing nitrogen. Um, and so boosting the plants uh, around it. So um, my familiarity with the oleaster family is, is primarily uh, two things. First of all, the uh, silver buffalo berry and the Russian olive. Uh, those are the ones that I'm around uh, the most. And uh, I guess one thing, uh, they're, they're sort of the, the contradictions of these plants uh, really fascinate me a lot. That uh, first of all, that they're they're kind of they're kind of dry land plants that um, you know they inhabit inhabit pretty dry places, but always uh, within say ten or fifteen feet of the water table. Uh, mm. That you know, and and then they have this uh, this very desert like uh, characteristics with the the, the you know the spine hairs that um, reflect sunlight. That's a that's a water conserving uh, quality. Uh, yet they're fast growing plants. Or at least the Russian olive is a fast growing plant, like a willow almost. And so there, yeah, these these kind of contradictions. And then uh, as far as like the Russian olive goes, that was uh, planted here for. Uh, you know, like for conservation to make shelter belts and all that. And then, uh, then of course, when it liked it here, then people are like, uh, oh, maybe that was a mistake. And uh, so now uh, a lot of places is trying to get rid of Russian olive. And um, uh, and like here in Montana, it's, uh, you're not allowed to like uh, plant it or spread it. You know, you don't have to necessarily kill it off, but you're not allowed to like, uh, make more of it, you know, to help it along. And so, is the rate it spreads alarming, or is it like known to have a negative impact on native plants or native habitat? Because I, when I think uh, of Russian olive, I see it in disturbed places, like you would other weeds. Um, mm. uh, I th there are places where I think it has uh, out, you know, outcompeted willows and created problems like for migrating birds that depend mm. on the willows or depend on insects that live on the willows. Mm. Um, and I haven't really looked, I haven't looked at those sites personally to kind of see what the ecological dynamics are because a lot of times, um, you know, when you have weed problems, like, so for example, your salt cedar that's, uh, or tamarisk that's invasive on, uh, especially Southwestern waterways, Mm -hmm. uh, and it gets blamed as you know for the for many evils. Yet, uh, if you look at the ecological side of it, it usually has more to do with uh, having controlled the water flows, so that you no longer have the the pulses of uh, the natural flood pulses that the cottonwoods depend on to germinate. Mm -hmm. And so the um, so it's not that the 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 salt cedar in that case has changed the uh, environment. It's that the environment was changed by human management, and this is what it now favors. So I um, so I'm suspecting that that is also the case uh, often with Russian olive. Uh, in my area, I don't really see it as uh, something that's harming other things. That it's like adding to the biodiversity as opposed to um suppressing something else mm -hmm. and uh and as is common with uh, a lot of plants it's like the related plants frequently grow together so uh you know i've got my homestead my ha house here in montana or in pony montana and then my wilderness survival school green university is uh located 25 miles from here uh down on the in the uh along the jefferson river and so on the drive there get into the uh, the river the valley bottom and so i'm driving through sort of a corridor of russian olives and native uh buffalo berries and all the the silver uh vegetation is, is you know complements all the greens and this time of year yellows and so it's really quite uh, striking and, and beautiful mm -hmm. and um uh you know and i have seen like on that um 
uh, Missouri trip uh, out on uh, a wildlife refuge in uh, central Montana, where um, you know well-intentioned wildlife managers are you know trying to uh, stick to the native plants and all that. Hit, we're just sort of uh, bombing. We're using a um, uh, you know, herbicide kill everything, uh, killed the Russian olives and just it'd be like this dead zone all the way around the Russian olives. And, uh, and I don't feel like those are well thought out, um, <laughs> plans. It's a very nice it, way know, to put that. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, and, and I've, I've kind of having been in the, in the plant world my whole life, uh, you know, I've been involved in the native plant side of it and the concerns, uh, and and uh, so there is a huge component of uh, you know that's ecology oriented that uses like herbicides to kill the unwanted things to help the native ones, and and I've uh, worked in that world myself, and even at one point got my applicator's license, and but but the more that I've seen, uh, the more it's like oh this uh, herbicide is. Uh, reducing our biodiversity and uh, and we're really attacking the symptoms of the problems uh, not the causes and so um, it, so it's very seldom that um, that the herbicides are actually doing what they're intended to do uh, and really probably the best use of them is in applications where you have uh, a small population of weeds that has not spread into an area and mm. to use the herbicides mostly to prevent bigger future, uh, you know, because it's like if it spreads, then somebody else comes in and uses a bigger bomb later. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, But 99% of the time, uh, I've just come to the conclusion that the herbicides are doing more harm than good. It is such a complex thing. I really loved what you said earlier about how um, human management has created an ecosystem, a change in the ecosystem, which has then resulted in favorable conditions for, uh, you know, a new set of plants to move in and how that's so often overlooked. And so many people in that other realm, like not herbalists um, generally, end up hating the plant. You know, they see tamarisk right. as the problem or mullein or, you know, whatever the thing is. It's like they hate the symptom without understanding the role. And then oftentimes those plants do have some, you know, obviously complex, but beneficial impact in the environment that they are growing in now, which it is a complex subject. I and mean, there's definitely some, it is. some tragedies there too. It's not all positive. Um, it is. You know, yeah, um, uh, in my area, uh, of course, spotted knapweed is a huge issue here in Montana. Here too, um, and yeah. Then, yeah, tansy being, uh, you know, a lesser one, but in, in, but big in my immediate area. And so, you know, I was kind of, yeah, inculcated to hate these plants. Uh, and somehow that seemed very normal until I spent more time uh, in Europe. And it's like, oh, here's uh, knapweed and, you know, 10 different species of knapweed and they're all native here. And here's tansy and it's native here. And it's like, uh, what is this twisted, uh, you know, experience I have where I've been taught to, to actually hate this plant, uh, which is honestly just doing what it's, it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, and one thing, um, you know, I've been, I, I've been, I guess, learning, uh, you know, as a native plant advocate, I've been learning to make peace with a lot of the invasives in uh, different ways. And sometimes that's not easy, particularly with spotted knapweed. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, but like one area, um, old railroad bed happens to be uh, at one of my favorite campsites on the Jefferson River. And it's like uh, this railroad bed, you know, it's, it's gravel, it's compacted. And it's like, if you look at the things that are going there, uh, the only things that are going on this railroad bed, it's knapweed, cheatgrass, mullein, leafy spurge <laughs> and it's like wow these plants are um uh colonizing this they're they're taking those uh, early steps to make this old railroad bed habitable for other things to be able to move in here one day and mm -hmm. uh, and so that really excites me is that okay yeah these plants are actually um doing something good here yeah, yeah, I don't know about all of those, but I know mullein specifically has been studied pretty extensively as being really powerful for soil remediation. 
Mm-hmm. And so where do, where do we need them? Along those railroad tracks, for sure. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, well, to go back to Russian olive, um, mm-hmm. I feel like there's like a thousand different paths we can go down. Uh, yeah. But I was curious, <laughs> have you um, have you worked with the berries? Like I get a lot of questions from folks like wondering, you know, what, what can I do with the be- berries in terms of, you know, are they, are they edible? Are they palatable? You know, that sort of thing. Sure, sure. Yeah, uh, I find there's a lot of uh, like decades long questions that uh, come up when when you're on the plant path. And so, uh, for me, one of those was a uh, long, long time ago. <clears throat> I read about uh, that Russian olives had been used to make bread in Arabia, and so of course go out and uh, you know and try the Russian olives, and they generally don't taste good. Uh, they they do vary. They vary a lot from tree. I mean, plants are as individual as as you and I are, and so they vary tremendously from one to another. And so even if the fruits look uh, similar, you go you, as a nibbler. You go from tree to tree and and uh, trying the Russian olive fruits, and some are like, yeah, it's not palatable at all. Others are uh, just a tinge of sweetness, like, oh yeah, maybe a little bit. And I have uh, you know tried a little bit in the past of. Uh, you know, what can I do with these? Can I, uh, you know, pound the whole fruits, seeds and all, uh, make them into something? And most of the answer was no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, my first, I guess, really exciting experience with Russian olive um, happened to be on that Missouri River trip. Huh. And uh, we had a, a shelter belt that had been planted um, as like a, a fish and Fish and wildlife refuge uh, as part of this uh, shelter belt. And it's like, it was Russian olive, but instead of just being uh, a, a hard gray fruit like we have here in Montana, it was actually uh, yellowish. And those fruits were sweeter, they were, they, they were pulpier. And I could uh, basically grab the berry and squeeze the seed out. And so I actually gathered uh, a fairly substantial quantity of Russian olive fruits, which I just mixed into like some uh, uh, ash cake dough, flour, water, Russian olives, plum fruits, and, and just cooked it like that. So nothing fancy, but it was like, uh, that was kind of an exciting moment for me. And and I guess the the, the dawning reality over uh, or realization over decades was that there are Russian olives in this world that uh, are a lot nicer than the ones that they planted for shelter belts here. Hmm. And I actually um, I actually ordered some um, off of Etsy from Turkey, and I have them right here. And um, uh, so and it's pretty cool. Let me, uh, uh, I know this will only show up on video, not audio, but uh, you can see that's like um, size of a small date, really. It almost and, looks like a jujube date, really. <laughs> Yeah, well, and that's been kind of a, a, a you know a question for me. I was trying to answer is is this actually a Russian olive or oleaster um, or not? But when you um, break it apart, it's all like uh, it's it's powdery on the inside. Hmm. Um, so it is almost in a way. It actually looks like uh, it's all over my desk now. Uh, <laughs> it looks like a little a pile of flour. Huh. And they're so they're kind of this weird. Uh, it's not it's not the dry like the astringent dry. It's it's just a dry uh, kind of a mealy, very mealy texture to it. A very sweet, and uh, and it does have a big seed in here, um, but it's like uh, yeah. This this I wonder is wonder if what, that's what they're making bread with. Uh, this is I'm sure this is must have been what they were making uh, bread with. And yeah, it still has a pretty big seed in there with a lot of uh, pulp adhering to it here, uh, and a big mess all over my desk now. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, yeah, they're 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 quite tasty, and and I suspect that um, uh, even if they were able to survive up here, our growing season probably isn't long enough mm-hmm. to mature the fruits. Um, but um, yeah, it was just sort of a decades long question of I read this that they were making bread in Arabia from Russian olives. And it just did not make sense when I go out and try our Russian olives. Uh, it was like, there's something wrong with this picture, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was like mystery solved, really. 
Yeah, yeah, I feel like mystery solved at this point. Hmm, interesting. Um, but one of the other things, and I was thinking about this today, is that um, uh, you know we and talk a lot about like you know people trying to cut down the Russian olives or or spare or whatever, and it's like I, I really wonder what is the potential to graft onto Russian olives. That, um, hmm. If you know if you don't want Russian olives, well, um, it's like the um, uh, autumn olive is you know same genus. Uh, can can you uh, graft on with that? There's a, a gummy berry, and I'm I'm not familiar with a gummy berry, but the pictures I look I've seen look delicious, and it's like, well, I wonder if I could get some grafting stock and uh, basically turn a Russian olive into a gummy berry. And so I think um, you know we we can just kind of um, look at the opportunities here and. And I guess one thing, um, uh, my homestead, uh, I've been permaculturing the place here for 35 years and don't actually have much food on the, the land yet. Uh, this, I, I have a, my, my homestead is a great solar site, a south-facing slope. It's very dry. It basically, it was a grassland. It wants to be a grassland. I'm always trying to convince it otherwise. Uh, and so I've, I have a huge number of trees, but they're not really, uh, they don't ever really reach a point where they're self-sufficient without supplementary water that, um, I have to, you know, I have a gazillion hoses and timers that, that keep my place green. And so, um, so I've had a lot of challenges in trying to permaculture my, my place and turn it into a food forest. And so. I've been taking up an increasing interest in in grafting, mm -hmm. and um, I don't actually have Russian olives here, but I do have some buffalo berries, um, mm -hmm. and I have a lot of uh, like wild plums. Some a lot of which are too astringent to uh, to really enjoy. But it's like, yeah, I have um, I actually have a lot of material here to work with that I'm you know interested in grafting over into something that I can use uh, rather than spending another thirty years trying to grow something from scratch because that's what it takes you know in, in mm -hmm. this, uh, this this particular climate and this particular uh, property here so. well I'm looking forward to seeing like where this curiosity leads you and like what you know like I've never heard of <laughs> grafting in that way and that's really fascinating so yeah well uh, you never know um, mm -hmm. but um, we'll see <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to share about the oleaster family or um, the Schipertia canadensis um, buffalo berry, right? That's buffalo berry. Sure, yeah. Uh, well, um, Schipertia argenta is the silver buffalo berry. And um, so we have quite a bit of that. We have a lot of that in this area uh, called buffalo berry because the berries were included with the meat uh, cooked by the Native Americans, mm -hmm. so added to the meat dishes. Uh, and one of the um, one of the things I really love about the buffalo berries is that the you can harvest the fruits in midwinter. So usually uh, there's such a panic through the growing season to get to this crop and that crop before the season ends. And then we have these very long winters here, you know, six or seven months of winter in Montana, and it's like there's always buffalo berries on the bushes. Uh, it's still best to get them fairly early in the season before they dry out too much. Uh, they're, you know, they're edible at any time, and the more they dry, the sweeter they are. But um, uh, when when they're plump uh, in the fall, you can go out, uh, and you usually want to wait until uh, after they've been frosted. It helps helps make them sweeter. Uh, but you can go out, put tarps under the bushes, uh, beat them with a stick. Uh, kind of, it's much faster than and and you know the bushes have thorns so it's the it's pretty painful to pick the fruits uh and just a lot faster to go out and beat the bushes with a stick you gather uh you know a large number of berries on the tarp you can kind of pull off any little broken sticks and thorny things and pull them out but then uh float off the debris and uh and then you know have gallons of uh buffalo berries uh which it's probably more than you're going to use <laughs> because they are a pretty, uh, you know, powerful uh, fruit. Uh, and um, yeah, it's like they're they're delicious. And uh, whether if you dry them and just eat them them straight, 
or uh, you know, like make them into a jelly or a syrup, and, uh, and so even even like once you sweeten them up with sugar, they say to make syrup. Uh, I know that there's there's too much of a good thing, and that uh, I've done pancakes before, where I'm like uh, eating pancakes with buffalo berry syrup, and then lose the ability to swallow. It's just like so uh, it gets so astringent that uh, mm. your mouth dries up. Uh, but I mean, the flour the flavor is amazing, but mm. I got to do it in moderation because it's just completely uh, the astringency closes off all the salivary glands, and mm. uh, you just cannot swallow. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, I don't think we have that kind here. We have the um the not tasty kind, but which I have whipped up. Um, it makes a really beautiful froth. Um, that I love the color. If I maybe I can find a photo I've taken of it before, but it's like it makes a soft pink color and it's very uh -huh. tonified, so it's very bubbly. Um, that's the kind we have here. And have you ever been able to make it into something edible? Um, well, it's edible. Is it palatable? Is well, it something I mean. that you yes. desire to eat? <laughs> yes. um, I I want to say we've definitely made the froth once. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah. yeah, it wasn't like a strong repeat. I will often eat them when I find them just as like, you know, like it being a nibbler and like tasting uh, the landscape and stuff. But you're not like, oh, I want a handful of those. Right. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I do the same thing. I see Shepardia canadensis, Canada buffalo berry, or, or russet buffalo berry in the mountains. Um, have a berry, uh, you know, eat a berry, and then remember why I don't do anything with it because they are <laughs> <laughs> pretty uh, bitter tasting. And I think there must be like a lot of saponins of it yeah, in there. That, um, yeah. And I think um, I think there, there's saponins, probably just less of it in the um, like our our um, silver buffalo berry that we have so much of here. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I'd um, uh, like put some, had some in a jar and it's like, you know, they, they smelled great. They tasted great. I put some in a jar, had the lid on it. And it was just like the next day. So it hadn't been sitting there long, but then opened it up and it just smelled horrible. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that was uh, uh, some of uh, the saponin uh, or mm -hmm. something in there. And so it's a, a very um, interesting plant that way <laughs> there's something about the plant like when i come upon it i really love it I, you know like it, mm -hmm. like it has that like friend feeling of like oh there you are um so i really like to greet it when when we you know find each yeah. other out there um, yeah and we have um thickets of it here uh, of the silver buffalo berry not the the canada but with the, of the uh so they're kind of thorny thickets but there's not a lot of thickets in montana and this is one where yeah you could kind of uh, disappear into the buffalo berry thickets and and I'd had some um, pretty cool experiences just like stalking wild turkeys around the buffalo berry thickets on the, the Jefferson River so uh, yeah just those good feelings about associating with with this particular plant and uh, uh, I'm wanting to get more of it going on my uh, river property so uh, I've actually been eyeing some in the, um, the right away of the road that just get mowed hmm. down. I think I want to dig those up, transplant them onto the property. Nice, nice. Mm -hmm. Well, have we covered the oleaster family, or is there anything else you'd like to share? Um, I'm sure there's always there's more, always. but you know, honestly, I think at this point I have more questions than answers about the mm. uh, oleaster family, and uh, you know, there, there's some that are becoming quite popular, like the uh, sea sea berry, sea buckthorn. Mm. Um, I don't, really, I don't have personal experience with those, uh, but it's something I really want to uh, explore. I just think the, the potential of this family is uh, is huge. Um, it's been overlooked, and that we can uh, integrate those more into our sort of permaculture homesteads. So. Hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. I love that you feel, you know, that I have more questions than answers, but like, like just great deal of respect for that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's just kind of the way to move through the world, really. Um. So I'd love to talk about like projects and offerings that you have, things you're working on. You mentioned you have mm -hmm. Green University. Um, your botany intensives sound amazing. Um, I'm guessing they're probably done for the winter, but probably it'll pick back up in the spring. We, we normally do one two-week botany and foraging intensive every year. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've done two in Washington, um, two in Montana, uh, one in Oregon, one in Idaho. I believe that's eight. Uh, and... 
Uh, and uh, next year will be either Oregon or Montana. I'm not, they're trying to resolve that right now. Cool. But yeah, it's like every every class is a new place, um, you know, different season, different um, plants, and different instructors. That uh, I mean, I I t focus on more of the plant family ID part of it. And then we partner with uh, other instructors that might teach uh, more herbalism or foraging. Um, and yeah, we, we've done a lot of different things. This year we were out uh, uh, digging up uh, plant fossils uh, in Idaho, which was amazing. Uh, and we visited um, a lady did some incredibly intricate uh, basket work. And her husband was... Um, Doing medieval book binding, so wow. making yeah every part of a, a you know the book. I mean thousands of hours into these projects, wow. uh, and um, um, you yeah, know we visited uh, Darcy Williams, uh, herbalist. Uh, that's the only time that we've overlapped and done the same thing twice. There is going going mm -hmm. back to her place. We did that in 2021, and yeah, just an incredible place there on the Big Salmon River. Nice, yeah. uh, that's fabulous. So. Uh, yeah, so every year is uh, totally different, and um, we have a lot of fun. It's like uh, it, it come, it's like this traveling tribe, a sort of a caravan mm -hmm. of you know, we can have up to 20 cars uh, going in a caravan down the road from campsite to campsite, and mm -hmm. uh, and we have the potlucks every you know, every night where people are trying to create these crazy gourmet dishes, and uh, uh, so it, it's just a lot of fun, and nice. um. And I, you know, I always learn a lot. So, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, two weeks. I mean, that's no joke. Two weeks, you really get to like sink into things and explore things yes. together, and like you know, get to know the group. And there's nothing and, better than hanging out with plant people. That's my and, yeah. unbiased opinion. Uh, totally, and and everybody has something to teach. So it's it's not mm -hmm. like uh, you know, not like just us teaching. It's like we're always wondering, well, how do you you know, how can we squeeze this into the schedule? And mm -hmm. or um, a lot of our evening time will, will turn into like student um, activities, student led activities, and. So, um, yeah, it just really uh, great relationships that uh, people make connections uh, that, uh, that that last after the class. Mm, lovely. Okay. And um, you have many books. You're a fantastic author on so many different okay. subjects and also games. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd love to hear about your wildlife ecology game. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, so wildlife web uh, is a dynamic ecology strategy game it's so it's basically a role player game that um uh it was inspired by it's very different from but it was inspired by uh time that i had, had spent um playing pokemon card games with my son uh, mm -hmm. when he was younger and it was like um he knew the sort of the life histories of all of these imaginary animals and all of their superpowers that these animals had. Um, and, and so wildlife web kind of looks at, uh, you know, what are the superpowers, um, of, uh, our regular wildlife. And uh, so really you, you, you have the opportunity to, you, you sort of have a hand of animals and it can be a mix of herbivores and predators and omnivores and, um, diurnal species and nocturnal, and and so, uh, and basically, what you're really looking to do is to uh, feed your animals, um, find a mate, have offspring, and raise your offspring to maturity to pass on the genetic line. And when you do that, you take them out as as points that you've successfully raised this this family. And so, uh, so it really it teaches wildlife ecology, uh, even uh, some aspects of bird language uh, in the game, and uh, and and then it can be um, it's interesting just playing with different people that uh, you know some are are just more almost more cooperative in terms of not really trying you know like if they have a predator uh, not trying to hunt other people's uh, and it's and there are certain rules that. Um, you know, you can't like hunt something bigger than yourself normally. Uh, and so there's little things that try to make these interactions as accurate, uh, ecologic as accurate as possible. 
Uh, but then you get into uh, uh, games with other people, um, and, and, and particularly some groups of adults that we've had that are, are just like trying to um, wipe each other out, you know, and um, set you know set each other back basically. But um, uh, yeah, ultimately the the goal is to uh, raise your little family and and uh, um, get get your offspring to maturity without becoming somebody else's lunch. Hmm. Lovely. <laughs> I love, again, like just your mind, Tom, like in all the different places, um, like uh, you're, you're just this like generalist, you know, and you're like, yeah, I'll write books. I'll create games. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> and so the, uh, I guess the, this ecology side of it is, is become uh, my new interest that I think starting with, um, with getting into plants, it's like, well, the first thing you want to know, what is its name? And then the second thing is, well, how can you use it? You know, can you eat it? Uh, you know, what can you do with it? Can you use it for medicine? Can you make cordage out of it or something? And then uh, the more time you spend with the plants, it's like you start paying more and more attention to, like, the, the geology, the soil conditions. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, well, why does this plant want to be here uh, versus there? Or why is it bigger in this environment, smaller in this environment? Uh, and then kind of looking at, you know, the different factors of, uh, well, what type of management, whether it's intentional management or accidental management, even neglect is a type of management. How, how, what does this have, uh, effect does this have on, on these plants or this environment? And so really it's just uh, kind of that deeper and deeper nature connection ultimately. And so that's my new book is um, writing... Uh, you know, writing a book about the ecology of the West. It's a small topic. <laughs> uh, and, and again, one of these things, it's like I, I have decades of experience on this and, um, and, it, uh, and a lot of things I think I know, which when I start doing the writing and the studying, sometimes I find contradictions that, um, you know, that, that uh, disprove what I was sure of. And so um, kind of being constantly tested by, the journey, uh, the research journey on, on this book, which, so there's a, you know, a great deal of uh, reading and online research associated with it, but also a lot of uh, fact checking of uh, doing tours across the Western states to oh, get out and look at the ground and um, uh, look at, you know, look at the plants, look at the soil, and, and, and a large part of it uh, also wanting to look at the, the carbon sequestration uh, mm -hmm. end of it as well. I mean, it's, uh, the, the 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 book is so broad in topic that there, uh, anything I say about it uh, become it can be true and misleading at the same time because of what it's not saying. Hmm. But I, I think probably the the best way to describe this uh, ecology book is it it's really about what was, what is, and what could be. That what the uh, landscape was like. Um, both, you know, it could be the deep time before Native Americans first came in and, and started making changes. Uh, certainly, you know, looking at it before uh, colonization and the changes that we've made, uh, looking at it, you know, as things are now, and also what the potential future is, which may be completely different than what it is or what it was. Hmm. And, and so, um, you know, trying to find some, like, holistic uh, long-term answers um, for that. Uh, and um, and really, we're, we're newcomers to this landscape. Um, we've it's just the little little things that we've done. Whether it's you know building a house in the floodplain that gets flooded out, if you spend enough time, enough centuries on a landscape, the landscape teaches you. You learn from it. You do things better. Well, uh, it's not just how we build, but it's also uh, how we grow uh, our crops, how we graze our uh, animals, um, how we recreate just uh, all aspects of our connection or lack of connection with the landscape. And so uh, it, it's going to take us some time to become native to this place. And this book, I want it to be a guide that will help people to become more native to the land we, we live in, whether that's, uh, you know, uh, for someone's personal interest or uh, land managers, policymakers, uh, anyone can uh, pick this up 
And really, the big question right now is, will this be 300 pages or 3,000 pages? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of my next question. Like, what, what is your timeline for this? Because I can't wait to read it. So Yeah, well, that's a, that's a, that remains to be seen. I'm, okay. Uh, okay. I'm almost three years into it. Um, okay. Well, two and a half years into it. It's going to be at least two and a half more to finish it. I don't know. I'll try not to pester you too much then. <laughs> the uh, uh, I, I honestly I do most of my writing in the winter, and mm. uh, I just scattered a million directions in the summer, so uh, that that makes it take longer too. Yeah. Well, I know you have a good in with a publishing company, so that won't be a problem. <laughs> That's one of the benefits. Well, you know, being a self publisher, there's pros and cons. One, right, yeah, right. My publisher approves my manuscripts. And that can be good. Get a, you know, I can, I, I can, it's like get a sunny day in the springtime. It's like, it's done. Okay. <laughs> I'm sending it to the printer and uh, that's nice for a quick turnaround. But uh, sometimes it's like, I'm too eager to get out the door and uh, you know, uh, go do stuff. And, and so I have, I have definitely published things prematurely in the mm -hmm. past. So mm -hmm. um, the, being my own boss has, uh, you know, it's upside and it's downside. <laughs> I hear, you. I hear you on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am very excited for that book. And, um, you know, if anyone is not already familiar with Tom's work, he has so many books and games and um, I highly recommend it as well as um, studying in person. Uh, it's a real treat as well. Well, I have a, one last question for you, Tom. And um, this is the perfect question for you because of your kind of like innate curiosity. <laughs> and um, that question is, what new things or skills are you currently cultivating with herbs? Mm. What's new on your mind? We already heard like the grafting was so cool. Tell, tell me more, Tom. <laughs> yes. So um, I'm probably the, uh, the permaculture. I mean, there, there's, I'm kind of all over the place, honestly, with, with the plants. Uh, and so like I was just talking about the botany and foraging intensive, um, the you know going out and harvesting uh, i mean it's just english walnuts so it's not even that wild or anything other than they grow like weeds out there uh and then the cranberries cranberries was exciting hmm. uh and so uh the, these russian olives from turkey or yeah it's all exciting um but i think uh, personally uh now i did a um actually hired a a, a, a permaculture pond maker came in a, a couple years ago and helped me build a really nice pond in the ravine on my property here. And as I said, I kind of live on a, a dry south facing hillside. And this has kind of energized me just having this uh, sort of a new little wetland area uh, to, to kind of take my homestead to the next level. And uh, so, uh, I mean, I'm constantly planting uh, new things here, trying that out. And and repeatedly trying to do too much at once and then i've kind of run into that problem with, with grafting and uh, one of the things i noticed with graft like watching grafting videos online is that uh you know people show how to do it and it's green and they come back six months later and you know look at you know their successful graft and the grass is still green in the background and it's like uh-huh okay because i was running into this problem that i would graft uh, do a graft and then in the middle of summer we just get hot and dry here and my grafts would dry out uh, mm -hmm. even if they were doing great until then. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that uh, and so I'm trying to do less. Uh, just mm -hmm. focus on one tree and graft it well uh, and get that established before trying to, you know, graft 50 different trees all at once here. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, give me a little more time and attention. Uh, that's one of one of the things that's exciting to me. Hmm. Do you feel like that's like a, um, I mean, in some ways it's almost like a personality shift, right? Like to kind of like rein in a bit and just be like, okay, like I'm going to just slow down and like focus and instead yeah. of doing it all at once. Yeah, I'm always wanting to scale up everything too quickly. Yeah, yeah me too. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah, yeah I got hide tanning. I do this thing called freeze tanning and, uh, uh, you know, putting hides out to freeze and thaw in this way that tans them without doing the physical labor of tanning and so hmm. um so i kind of you know i had i got a um had a beautiful hide that i'd freeze tan and then i tried scaling it up to like 40 hides at once and then i had just a huge mess that took me years to oh, <laughs> clean oh. up so <laughs> 
uh, anyway, scale up too fast, but yeah. got to rein that in and uh, um, get farther by doing less. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, I'll <laughs> let you know when I start to follow it. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, it really is um, great advice. Um, yeah, this has been so lovely. It's been great to see you after all these years. And yeah, um, yeah great to hear your thoughts on ecology. And um, yeah, and just like I want to soak up that curiosity that you have, the nibbler, you know, experiential <laughs> personality. And um, well, yeah, all of that's I, just really inspiring. I would so love to come out uh, to your neck of the woods again and, and visit out there. And Absolutely. And, Today on uh, my walk, I was like, Tom would love it here right now. It's really beautiful. Um, you know, it always is everywhere we are, but something yeah. about today, I just thought he'd like it here. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we'll make that happen someday. All right. <laughs> Sounds thanks, good. Tom. All right. Thank you, Rosalie. <laughs> As always, thanks for being here. Don't forget to head over to the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com to download your handout on the oleaster plant family. There, you'll also be able to sign up for my weekly newsletter, which is the best way to stay in touch with me. You can find more from Tom at www.holotop.com. If you'd like more herbal episodes to head your way, then one of the best ways to support this podcast is by subscribing on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks, and I'm so glad that you're here as part of this herbal community. Also, a big round of thanks to the people all over the world who make this podcast happen week to week. Nicole Paul is the project manager who oversees the whole operation from guest outreach to writing show notes to actually uploading each episode and so many other things I don't even know. She really holds this whole thing together. Francesca is our fabulous video and audio editor. She not only makes listening more pleasant, she also adds beauty to the YouTube videos with plant images and video overlays. Tatiana Rusikova is the botanical illustrator who creates gorgeous plant and recipe illustrations for us. I love them. I know that you do too. Christy edits the recipe cards and then Jenny creates them as well as the thumbnail images for YouTube. Alex is our tech support and social media manager, and Karen and Emily are our student services coordinators and community support. For those of you who like to read along, Jennifer is who creates the transcripts for us each week. Xavier, my handsome French husband, is the cameraman and website IT guy. It takes an herbal village to make it all happen, including you. All right, you've lasted to the very end of the show, which means you get a gold star and this herbal tidbit. I actually have a couple of just random thoughts following this chat with Tom. One is that I said I should mention the Stone Age Living Project with Lynx Vilden. Lynx is a friend of mine who's world famous for her skills and teachings of how to live without modern day technology. And my handsome French husband, Xavier, along with Tom and others, did her summer program many years ago where they spent the summer preparing food and clothing and tools and then spent up to a month living in the forests with Stone Age technology only. It's a really inspiring project, and Lynx often does these types of trips, in case you're interested. The other thing that I'd like to share is just about Russian olive. My one experience of this tree is that my beekeeper friend Susie has one on her property, and the bees just go bonkers for this uh, tree when it's in flower. So just a random tidbit there. As always, thanks for listening.